Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Okay, 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 Clifton. Yep, what now? You set this up. I did. In our last podcast. I did. This is Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. There's Mark Halleck sitting right there. Uh, and uh, I'm Dan Hurst, and uh, you said, okay, we're going to talk a little bit more. A follow-up, last time we talked about how to assess the readiness for a church to be revitalized, and what are we talking about today now? Well, six keys a pastor must provide to his church as they begin the revitalizing process. Mm. So see how that works? First, number <laughs> one, the how to know your church is ready. Yeah. Number two, yeah. six things you can give your church, and then... Wait, there's more. Oh, there's. There is <laughs> By more. the way, Dan. One of the things Dan does, he's voiceover talent for TV commercials, movie trailers, all kinds of things, including infomercials. Oh, infomercials. And he's say, wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. See, there you go. <laughs> so, but wait, there's more. The first, you can go back and listen to last week. It's called "How to Assess Your Church Is Ready to Be Revitalized." This week. Six keys you can give your church for utilization. But wait, there's more. Next episode, how to prepare for long-term revitalization. Mm-hmm. See how that works? It's like, a, it. it's like a trilogy. It's like a trilogy. It's a trilogy. I love it. I love it. The package deal. It's, it's a tri- and, and it's three for the price of one. That's right. <laughs> All right. So today, here we go, Mark, Dan, six things a pastor must give his church. Okay, here's number one. You ready? I'm ready. A healthy dose of... Of reality, boy, this is painful. Well, it's like yeah. it's like my my <laughs> doctor a few days ago when I went for my annual mm-hmm. physical. You know, a heavy dose of reality is. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure you're fully aware of this, Pastor, but um, <laughs> you, you have a bit of a weight issue, and we probably need to address that. Yeah, I said, it's a reality really? check. I, I had no idea. <laughs> I, I my, it was wife, my mirror. <laughs> my wife is going to be so shocked. <laughs> A heavy dose of reality. And sometimes the reality is simply pointing out the incredible obvious, yeah. which yeah. is we're not going to be around much longer if we don't make some changes. Boy, that's painful to say, though, isn't it? It I mean, is. Cause yeah. you, I mean, you come in, if you're new, yeah. and you're coming in, and, and obviously you can't just say it right out of the box. <laughs> you, yeah. You've got to yeah. fall in love with these people, and they've got to fall in love with yeah. you. Yeah. But how do you... How do you present that? Uh, give me give me some some okay. preacher hacks here. Here's some ways to present it. One thing you can do is uh, you can go back and find in your church office a uh, a church pictorial directory from Olin Mills back in yeah. 1979. Because trust me, every church in the 70s and 80s had an Olin Mills pictorial directory. Mm-hmm. So go back and find your your church directory from 78 or 79, and then find out the addresses of those members and put them on a map. You know, just you don't you know Google Map. Just put them, pin them on a map, and then look at your membership today and pin them on a map, and then put the two things up on the screen side by side and say, look, in 1980, 1990, whatever, here's how many people were were members of our church. Here's all these red dots, and look where they all lived relatively close to our church. Today, look how fewer red dots we have, and look how few people live around our church. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that is a stark picture. Yeah. Wow. We and you say if the trend continues, ten years from now, this mm-hmm. is how many dots we'll have, mm. and fifteen years from now, there won't be any. Yeah, I mean, there, there are ways you can do that to help them see the reality of their situation. Mm. Uh, Dr. Rayner and I have talked about this on many occasions. We've done consultations with churches, and they've given us their information like that. Maybe they'll give us their their worship attendance from the ACE annual church profile over the last 25 years. Their their giving, their expenditures, their their membership gains, their membership losses, and we'll graph it up there on a chart, right? Mm-hmm. And show them everything. You can't see this cuz we don't have cameras, but I'm using my hands to show you this. <laughs> I have no idea why I'm doing that cuz nobody can see this. But we graphed it up on a chart, we show them all that, and I, we both have had people look at that and go no, those numbers aren't right. Mm. And we go, they're your numbers. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You gave them to us. No, that can't be right because we, we can't be that. Wow. Look, Ed Stetzer reminds us that facts are our friends. Mm. And you have to give them the facts to mm-hmm. show them. Because it's like the frog in the kettle. They, they don't realize how bad it's gotten. Yeah. Have, you ever gone, have you ever gone back to the hometown you grew up in? And, uh, and you grew up there as a kid, 
and you loved it. You have all these memories of it. And you go back 50 years later, and, oh, my goodness, it looks parts of it look so run down mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so neglected. But it doesn't necessarily look done, run down and neglected to the people who live there mm-hmm. because it happened over a long period of time, and they haven't seen the stark differences. Yeah. It's the s- same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, again, going back to just using me as a fantastic example, um, you know, I'm 64 years old. If you if you saw a, you know a photo of me when I was 44 years mm-hmm. old and the size that I was and my beautiful blonde hair <laughs> and my gorgeous skin and you know I was all and then you put a picture next to that of me at 64 where I'm much larger and my skin is all wrinkly and my hair is all gray if I woke up one morning from 44 and I looked just like that at 64 I'd be freaking out what's mm-hmm. wrong but it took 20 years to get there and yeah. I don't to me, it doesn't look all that different. It doesn't yeah, look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That took a long way to say it, but you have to help them understand the reality of their situation because to them, they often simply don't see the drastic nature of mm-hmm. their situation. Mm-hmm. So you have to help them do that, and that doing it with the graphs, doing it with all those kinds of things. Also, helping them come up with stories. You, ever, you go back in your church's history, you'll find pictures of vacation Bible school, kids on the front steps. Blow those up, put them up, yeah. let people see them. This is what we used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the one of the things I was going to say practically that we've done with a lot of churches, which is kind of a positive way to kind of approach this, is what we just call the timeline exercise. And so, on a big whiteboard, you you put the the, the year the church was started and just draw a straight line to 2024, and get the key leaders of the room and say, hey, let, let's talk about all the great things God has done and when He did them in this church. And here's what you find over and over. Oh, I remember when, and you've got all these great events. We had baptisms and that Easter Sunday, and you remember this and all this stuff. And so the first half of this thing is packed with so much. And then the closer you get to the end, there's fewer and fewer things. And so the picture itself Mm -hmm. kind of shows, Mm. wow, look at all that God was doing then. Wow, that's good. And now God hasn't changed. Well, what it does is, without being the, the jerk, it's it the picture itself is pain, is is naming reality. Yeah, does that make sense? So yeah. there's different exercises that I think can be really helpful. And in- we do say one of the one of the um, symptoms of a dying church is they anesthetize the pain of death with an overabundance of activity. Mm. In other words, we just keep doing yeah. things so we're not dying. We still come on Sunday school, Sunday mm. morning, maybe Sunday night and Wednesday night. We still have deacons meeting. We still have church council. We still have finance committee meetings. Still doing stuff. We're still doing stuff. Yeah. And so that numbs the reality that we're actually dying. Yeah. And so you have to give them a healthy dose of reality. Yeah. Number two, Mark, talk about this one. A, a pastor has to give them not only a healthy dose of reality, yeah. but he has to give them unconditional love. Yeah. I mean, this goes back to, again, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, mm-hmm. right? This is basic stuff. But especially coming off the heels of number one, if we're going to help them see reality, which, again, is often called the number one job of a leader is to name reality and help your people name reality. Well, in the church, this is where it's different. You're not a CEO of a company. You're a shepherd of a flock. And, and it all comes down to, listen, these folks are going, look, why should I trust you? Why should I listen to you? Are you going to be just another guy who's out in two years? And so when we talk about winning the hearts of God's people— you win their hearts with unconditional love and grace over and over and over. That's why when we hear guys say, well, you know, I'm not a real people guy. I'll, 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 I'll hire, I'll bring somebody on my staff who yeah. can love the people. I, I just like to preach and lead. And you say, brother, listen, don't be a pastor, man. Mm-hmm. Don't be a pastor. You're, if, if you're called to ministry, you're a man who loves God's people, yeah. even when it's difficult. And so as we even assess replanters, how do I know if I'm called to replant? Well, one of them is, are you ready to love tired people, some hard people, mm-hmm. <laughs> over and over again for the long haul? Mm-hmm. Unconditional love. And so it's, it's absolutely critical if we're going to win the hearts of the people. Well, I, you know, the truth of the matter is you can't love somebody at their best if you don't love them at their worst. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, 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 the, and the fact of the matter is when you go into a church that's in the kind of situation most of your churches are in, they're at their worst. Yeah. 
That's and, right. And you have to fall in love with them where they are now, yeah. not where they're going to be. Because yeah, you'll never good. get to where you want to be if you don't love them now. And, and part of it, too, is their shame. So there's not only – sometimes the reason they're hurt, they respond, you know, is because they're ashamed. They're embarrassed. They, they remember the golden well, years. Well, they feel like they're the ones you know? that have let the church down. Yeah, right. It's their generation. They failed. They failed. And I love the term we use here, unconditional love. It's mm. one thing to love members who love you. Mm-hmm. You know, big deal. Right. It's another thing to love members who don't love you. That's right. Mm-hmm. And when they push back on you yep. and they say mean and evil things against you, that's, that's unconditional This is love. where we, you and I have talked about this many times. What do you do with that angry person that's going to be coming every week yeah. and they don't like you? You lean And in everything the, in you wants to run away. What do we do? You, you lean into the awkward. You lean into the awkward and you go right after them. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you, keep, you, love them. you keep loving them. Over and over and over we again. We do. Unconditional love. Yeah. And that's hard, but that's where we need the Lord. We need the, the grace of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. And we would preach to ourselves that that is how we are loved. That's right. Exactly. Lou Miller used to say mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's the difference be- between saying you again mm-hmm. and saying you again. Oh, well, that's yeah. great. Uh, and uh, that, that is good. He said that's the approach that he had to that's take. That's good. With, that with is church. really good. Yeah. So we're looking at the, the third thing, then. We've got a healthy dose. A, do, dose, a healthy dose. I do this for a living, you, you know. And uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not for much longer. Much longer. Not much longer. <laughs> a healthy dose of reality, unconditional love. And then my favorite word in the Bible is hope. And I, I, I be frank, I, I see, I see how, like, this is where you shine is in hope. Um, just, just walk in a room, and I, I feel better when you're here. Hmm. There's just, God has just given you a giftedness of, of hope mm. and, and your life has not been easy i mean i mean by any stretch of the imagination going to a church of 30 people and replanting that thing and all that uh, and the serious health problems that mm. your family had that yeah. you went through that no one would want to have to go through yeah. it's, it's not been easy mm. but through all you you picture this hope mm. and 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 just like angst and cantankerousness and sarcasm yeah. is contagious hope is contagious yeah. and I, I got to work at this. I'll be honest with you. Um, I've been told, you know, I, I'm a good encourager of people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Lord maybe has given me a sense of empathy in encouraging people. But sometimes I I have to battle, find hope. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a tendency sometimes yeah. in my empathy with them to get so discouraged <laughs> with them. That, that I, I feel so bad for them. Go down the tube yeah, with them. Yeah. But, but, so I have to work at, at that hope. but. Yeah. Man, if, if you're not, if you can't give your congregation mm. hope, you can't lead revitalization. Yeah. Let's divine. Right. Let's define yeah. hope. Yeah. Well, here's what hope is not. Hope is not cross your fingers. Mm. I think a lot of people in our culture, when we talk about hope, it's like, man, spring training's coming. Yeah. The Rockies here in Denver, we're sure hoping yeah. that our Rockies can can win. But wishing. But here's what we know. Eh, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Biblical hope almost has an expectation because it's, it's aligned with faith. So there's, there's, a, there's a trust and a faith that God not only can, but we believe that he will mm-hmm. in accordance with his. And that's a game changer. And, 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 and in some ways, you can obviously say he already has. And he already has. That's right. Yeah. It's already been done. It's already been done. Yeah. It can't be undone. Yes, that's he, right. He has already prepared a place for us. Yep. It can't right. be undone. He's already purchased our redemption. Yep. It can't be undone. You know, that that's the hope of future glory. And again, I couldn't agree that's with so I good. can't agree with you more. You know, I hope the Chiefs win. That's so the word hope is so different. In the in the New Testament we're talking about hope, it's it's a hope of a certainty. Yes, it's certain. Not a possibility. Yeah. My hope is in a certainty. I have yeah. a hope that that's there. Yes. It can't be moved. It's confident yeah. anticipation. You know, there yeah, you yeah confident anticipation. You know, that's yeah. exactly. What, and, and if you don't have that, then your people aren't going to. No, no, no. no. Right. And, and Satan knows that. And he, he comes at you and he comes at me and attacks me all the time. Because mm-hmm. just about the time you think you sort of crested the hill, yeah. something else comes. And you go, another thing? Another one? Yeah. Another issue? I'm yeah. so weary. Yeah. You know, and, you know, we're, so, yeah, hope. Man, you have to – you've got to find it in your own heart, in your own life, through your relationship with Christ. Yeah. And then that is from what you – I've heard you say so many times, Mark, and it's so, so true. Guys, when you walk into a room, whether it's a committee meeting or whatever, do people feel better when you show up? Mm. Do you exhibit a sense of hope and enthusiasm yeah. Yeah. and joy? 
or is it like, well, here comes a pastor. He'll be like, he's had a bad day. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Seriously. Yeah. Who you are, I mean, it's, and this is the leadership piece of all of this. You can't take people where you haven't been. Mm-hmm. You, you, you know, you te- we've said this so many times. You teach people what you know. You reproduce who you are. And so if you want a hope-filled people, a joyful people, a passionate people, then that begins by the grace of God in me as a leader. What kind of leader am I? If I'm just talking about it, but I'm not seeking to live it. And so, again, this is where we just have to – we got to name reality first in our own hearts. Hmm. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm coming in – we were just talking with a group of, of guys. If you look ticked off all the time when you walk into a room, don't expect people to want to hug you, man. No. Don't expect people to actually want to be around you. So part of it's going, man, do you know the joy of the Lord? Is that something you need to get on your knees and beg God for? Because if you're bitter and angry, don't be surprised when your people are bitter and angry. It's just how it is. And if you have hope, that takes us to our next point. Mm. And that is that, and here's the thing, hope has to have legs. Yes. Yes. And that brings us to this fourth one, and that's a clear plan forward. Yep. Yeah. There's got to be, listen, th- what I would say is there's got to be strategy. It does. There's got to be strategy. It's not going to just happen. No. It's not enough to just be, hey, guys, God loves you and he's great and there's hope. Well, right. that's awesome. But now what? Mm-hmm. What is it? What, I like how you said a hope has legs. Where are we going? What are we doing? And that's where we've, when we talk about uh, uh, replanters being visionary shepherds, right. the shepherding piece is the caring. we got to love people. care. But there's a visionary piece of leadership that says, we're going to go somewhere. We're going to mm-hmm. do some stuff. And this is where we're going. And this is why we're going there. And this is how we're going there. Yeah. You know, I, we talk about two things, a clear plan. That can be, that can be sh- many times that's going to be short-term initially. You may not have a long-term clear plan. Yeah. God's yeah. not revealed that to you yeah. yet. You don't yeah. know enough. Don't over-freak out about what's your 10-year plan for Good this point. church yeah. or your five-year plan. You may not have one. Right. I'll never forget one time I, I heard Mark Dever say when he first went to Capitol Hill, uh, the associational missionary there was very grateful this young man was coming to this church because mm-hmm. it it's a very historic church just a few blocks from from uh, the the uh, uh, Supreme Court right there in Washington and it was really in deep decline and so he said we were walking around the outside of the building and the director of mission says well Mark what's your plan for this church and mm-hmm. Mark said I don't have a plan he said the director of missions looked shocked and stunned and and he said you know I know God you know, Mark was basically clarified it and said, you know, God will have a plan, and he'll reveal that plan to me, and mm-hmm. as he does, we'll follow it. But I don't come in here with a, this is how I'm going to revitalize yeah, this yeah, church. Yeah, yeah. And so sometimes guys will talk to me about revitalization and tell me what their whole plan is. I think, really? Yeah. Or maybe that's your plan, not God's plan. Here's what I would say. A clear plan moving forward. First, remember, if you go back and listen to it, if you haven't listened to the last, last one we did. First, their hearts have to be humble. What's your plan to get their hearts yeah, humble? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yep. What's your plan to get your people to love Jesus more? Yep. Yep. What's your plan to get your people to love the community more? Yep. What's your plan to get people to pray with more yes. intensity and That's passion? Right. What's your plan to get people to be willing to do whatever it takes? Yep. You can plan those things. And as you do those, the next things, you've always got to be one step ahead. Yeah. Of, Here's the next thing we're doing. You don't need to be five years ahead yeah. or ten years ahead. Yeah. Okay, so what? But you do have to have a plan. Yeah. This is what we're doing right yeah. now. So this is the next thing we're doing right now, and it has to be hope filled. Yeah. Sunday morning, uh, I was uh, at, at uh, this this revitalization that we're part of in in Raytown, Missouri, and uh, I was preaching, and it came time to to dismiss the the, the children we have in worship, and thor- fortunately now we do have some kids in worship. And we dismiss them to go in, into a, a, you know, birth through five or four or whatever down the hall. And so, you know, as they're being dismissed, you know, I, I simply said, you know, down that hallway where they're going, you know, there are whatever, eight or nine rooms made for children. And don't you know, don't you know that God is going to fill those rooms with yeah, kids? That's good. Can't you just see one day, not, not mm-hmm. a handful of children in those rooms, but every room full? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't you see that? Because that's, that's the way you I have to it. give them hope that's right. that God's going to do something. If they see that in you, they begin to, to see it in yeah. them. I don't know how we're going to get there right now, yeah. but my plan moving forward is right now we've got to, we've got to do yeah. these things I just said. We've got to be more humble. We've got to pray more. Right. We've got to love the community more. And we got to get those rooms ready. We got to clean yep. them up, get That's them right. ready. There are certain things we can do. It's only it's more of this. It's less linear. Well, here's my plan: step mm-hmm. A, step B, step D, and more 
Um, what are the ingredients? Oh, that's good. What are the ingredients? What are the yeah. – you could say practices. There's different ways you could say it. But what are the key pieces that will help move this church toward greater health? That's what we want to focus on. Well, Does that make easy, sense? It's easy to have a vision, with, and, 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 but it's not easy to have a plan. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and yeah. a lot of a lot of us have a vision yeah. for where we sure. want the church to be, but we don't have. A How plan. are we going to get there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Totally. Uh, then, along with that clear plan forward, comes something that actually is almost full circle, and that is a love for the community. I mean, just a, a falling in love with that community. I always think about you, bud. Like you're like at Warnell. And the schools. I mean, that's and everything. That the, was a unique everything you guys families did. Of homicide victims. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. All everything of that. we did, just loving the community. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that to me, that that's in many ways the secret sauce for a revitalized church. Isn't how many people you get there on Sunday morning, mm-hmm. or how do you attract new members? It's how do the remaining members use the resources they have to love the community yeah, and I to serve that. the community willingly, willingly, yeah. and not in order to grow their church. It's yes. not. It's not like. You know, hey, we want you to come and buy your car from us, so you know we'll yeah. we'll put on a great party and eat your hot dog here, then come back here and we'll sell you a car. Yeah. It's not like, hey, yeah, we yeah, want to yeah. do this to so come to our worship yeah. service. Yeah. We want to do this because we love you, yeah. and because Jesus loves you, and we want to make your life better. We want to improve your life. We want to, <laughs> we want, we want the fact that we are in this neighborhood to in, to to make the the lives of people in this neighborhood noticeably better. That's what Christians do when they show up. We mm-hmm. want to be the most generous people yes. in our community. Yeah. Because and for them to know it. And for them to know it. Yeah. And we're doing it because we love Jesus. Yeah. And, and Jesus I, loves it. And them. I think that's so important because what you're saying there flies in the face of a lot of traditional church growth strategy, which would say it's all about metrics. So yeah. if we do this event, how do we know it's successful? Oh, yeah. um, well, how many people showed up? How many people came the next Sunday yeah. to church? And, that, and so it's all based on that. What you're saying is right and by the way, that that's church growth thing, that kills pastors. You mm-hmm. feel like a failure all the time. Yeah. But saying, no, this is what, you said it, this is what Christians do. This is what we do. This is what we do, and, man. And we don't we have, love our community. We don't have block parties to get the people to come into your morning worship service. You have block parties to get the people who attend your morning worship service to, to get, be in the lives that's of right, the people that's in the right, community. That's right. That's right. It's totally, totally different. And we want, of course, of course, we love, we want people to come. Of That'd be course. great. But that's not the the reason we're doing it. Right. And so anyway, you've modeled that so and well. We do, and, and here's, people often will come to me and say, well, you know, our community is maybe upwardly mobile. Maybe it's even a wealthy community. They don't really need mm-hmm. clothes. They don't need a block party. They got plenty of things to do. They don't even need sporting events. Our kids are all, they're all kids are all in private clubs, sporting clubs. You know, we're a wealthy community, maybe gated communities. You know, we don't we don't need that. How how do how do you show love mm. for a community that seems pretty self contained, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Now it doesn't mean they don't have problems, right? But they're not going to let you in on their problems, right? No. Now they're they're they're, they're going to be sealed off. How mm-hmm. do you do that? Well, we could do a whole podcast on this, but one of the things that we found some success with because part of where Warnell was, our, our that church was part of that was the wealthiest uh, zip code in Kansas City, Missouri. And so we found some opportunities to help different parts of our city that were in deep, deep trouble. And, and you know, people today want their life to, to matter. That's why people are so quick to jump on global causes to save a planet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's a, yeah. look, we need to be good caretakers of the planet. God left, he gave Adam and Eve charge of the garden. So we're to take care of it. Yeah. I'm not saying we don't take care of it, so don't send me any emails. <laughs> but when someone says, do your part yeah. to save the planet, it's like, well, the planet's pretty big. But if I'm, if I'm doing something, I feel like, well, my life matters because mm. I'm, I'm saving the planet. My yeah. life is important. So people are looking for purpose. Right, yeah. Okay? Don't look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. <laughs> first. <laughs> I know where I'm going with this. Yeah. And so, so even in a wealthier neighborhood, you live in a, you know, a, a kind of a – Lakewood in Kansas City is, you know, it's the people there don't have a lot of surface needs of clothing and food and stuff like that. But they want their life to matter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what we did is we found we found ways to to go into the city and and deal with some of the most critical problems in our city. Like we have incredibly 
high murder rate in Kansas City, one of the highest. So we began to work with some organizations that work with the parents of murder victims, the siblings of murder victims. Mm -hmm. And so every year we would have opportunities to do things for the family of homicide victims and to try to meet some of their needs. Or some of the kids, they're at most at risk to never go to, never finish high school. And if they were involved in any kind of sports activities, the chance that they would finish high school goes up significantly. Mm. But they couldn't be in sports activities because they didn't have cleats to be in football. Mm. They didn't have. So what do we do? We become the group that can try to answer some of those problems. And we go literally sometimes door to door, literally, and certainly through social media and stuff in this wealthy neighborhood. Yeah. Say, look, we want to be part of solving this problem at the poorest high school in our city. Would you like to help us provide cleats for the football team? Yes, my life, I want to be part of it. I want to make my community better. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they're helping you reach meet right, needs, yeah. right? You're building and, bridges. And in doing yeah. that, you're building bridges. Yeah. So, so find ways. And we even did it overseas. The, um, our association had a, had a ministry to uh, uh, unaccompanied minors in, a, in, in the Horn of Africa who were, who were um, uh, refugees. Hmm. And so we were, they were creating um, a library, literally, in, in, this, in this refugee camp for children and to teach them to read and teach them to read English. And so they needed some children's books. So you go to some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Kansas City and you say, here's, here's, a, here's a, 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 a orphanage in a camp yeah. on the Horn of Africa of, of children who are desperately in need. Would you like to help us provide mm. some reading material for Yes, that would be great. Yeah. So you could find ways to connect to the community, even when they're maybe a higher income community. Then, but That's whatever great. you do, That's great. like it says, number five, a love for the community, a connection to yeah. community. Yeah. And not about getting those people to come to our worship service, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but getting us to be into their lives. I it love gives it. me a way to connect to those people. They get to know me. We can share the gospel with them. Yeah. All right. Okay. Here's That's entirely la- too long. No, you it's guys so good. Do the rest it, of no, the here's number six. No, <laughs> it was awesome. It was awesome. No, it wasn't. It was. It was. I lost my train. It was of so thought. great. I, I loved it. Halfway through there, we went someplace. <laughs> it else. was fantastic. No, it wasn't. We're either. on the Horn of Africa now. I this is no amazing. Idea. I lost it all. Number six, last one. Respect for their history and their heritage. Talk about this because you and, did this. <clears throat> and this is just saying, look, man, when you come in. Yes, you are moving uh, into a new future. You, you're leading with hope. You're leading with love all these things, but you also need to celebrate all that God has done. You're entering into a story. This is where um, I've shared this before, but I remember overhearing a denominational leader uh, once. He was talking with a group about why he didn't believe in replanting. And he basically said, why would you want to spend your time dealing with all that baggage Mm. when you could just start something new? Mm. Because he was a church plant guy. And we love church planting. We're, we're, we're both church planting we and replanting. But guys. sometimes church planters don't get us. Right, right. You no, know, that's right. We're, they we're, they we're don't. Weird. They look yeah. at us and go, I'm not sure why you're yeah. going through all that work. Let's just go start a new one. Oh, man. I well, and I heard that, and I actually pulled him aside. I, I felt pretty convicted by it and said, listen, um, you know, brother, here's the truth. What we're trying to do in replanting is come alongside. We're entering a story that God has been writing for many, many years. And, and they, these people, their lives have been transformed by that story in this place, in this church. They are not baggage. They are God's people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> these are not stories to be thrown out and burned. These are stories to be elevated and celebrated. Why? Because God's at work. Yeah. God has been at work. And so part of the thing that should excite you as a replanter is is – and it's one of the things you and I share, is a love for history. Yeah, we do. A love for history. And going in, and, and the humbling privilege it is to walk into this church and appreciate the history, appreciate the heritage. One of the, Just real practically, one of the things we do in all of our replants is we put up what we call a legacy wall, and I've shared this before. But it's very practical. Get into the closets, find those old black and white pictures, put them up on the wall so that people can see them every week, that you're not ashamed of the past. You love the past. And... Uh, and boy, those folks who have been there, that's a way to win their hearts because they see that you love them. Except the pictures of the pastors. Yeah, because they didn't <laughs> look happy. Get rid of those they things. All Get rid so of those happy. I, well, I, found, I found a picture at Warnell when I was there that the sanctuary was packed with people. They were actually standing in, you know, on the side of the aisle. It was like a high attendance day or something. Packed. You couldn't get any more people in it. But it was from 1937, 38, mm-hmm. something like that. So it was, it was cool looking old yeah, picture. Yeah. It was a great old picture. So I had it put on a T-shirt. We had T-shirts made, and that picture was on the front. 
and it said Warner Road Baptist Church, loving God, loving people in Brookside since 1921. <laughs> okay? That's really cool. Now, that's really cool. That's Especially really cool. in a historic neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right? So, First yeah. of all, the older people loved it. Yeah, but the younger people they loved, loved it. it too. So that's what we mean about a respect for the heritage. Yeah, yeah, so that that's you, right. there's something cool that happened here all these years, and yes. we're not walking away from that. Amen. We're building on we're that. We're building on it. That's so right. the six things a pastor has to give his congregation is a healthy dose of reality, unconditional love, hope, a clear plan to move forward, a love for the community, and of course the respect for their history and heritage. All right. Now, we're going to wrap this up because in our next podcast, we're going to talk about how you prepare to do that on a long-term basis. Man, are are we thorough or what? You know, the thing that scares me about that is I know how long this podcast went. I I can't imagine what that one's going to be like. I promise I won't talk about the Horn of Africa. (laughs) Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.